Anamikage Bina. Welcome back. This is part two of the Nishra Swayaj Kodayan Nigan Nigana Kag, the Seven Fire Prophecies. Okay, we are going to to the fifth and sixth and seventh fires and what the interpretation of what uh what that's about you let me know what uh okay. so we'll be on this fifth one so by this time the people have uh reached a place in the in the upper uh, peninsula area called Bawai Tong. That place is called the Rapids, and it's where Lake Superior flows into uh, Lake Michigan. It was also a place where the people had uh, left uh, uh, uh that one large island now uh, go back to the the photograph yeah manitoulin island and from there they which reached bawai tong from there uh they spread north and south and uh there was seven there were several other stopping points uh one at uh they call uh, Island Royal or outside of the uh, Thunder Bay area in, in Ontario. Then they came to a place called uh, Spirit Island, Manitoua, Minnesis. Uh, and there they found what had been prophesied to them that. Uh, the find their final one of their next to their final place uh where they would find monomen the food that grows on the water um eventually the megas showed them that they had to reach a third or excuse me a seventh island their final destination and there they came to a place called uh Madeline Island, or it was also called uh, La Point Island, and that's right off uh, uh, Superior Red Cliff. And it was said that uh, there they flourished for several hundreds of years, and uh, uh, the Medeoan was at its highest peak since then. So by then, the Anishinaabe had, they were all over uh, on north and south of uh, Lake Superior at that time. And the fifth uh, spirit spoke in the time of the fifth fiery, uh, there will come a great struggle that will grip the lives of all native people at the waning of this fire, there shall come amongst them uh, people who hold a uh, promise of great joy and salvation. If the people abandon the old teachings and accept the new promise, then the great struggle of this time will continue for many generations to come. All those who accept this promise of salvation will cause the near death of the people. So during this time, around 1610, 1620, uh, around the rapids, uh, Bawe Tung, the place is known, that they encountered the first white people and uh, who came in great boats. And they couldn't go any farther because of the rapids. And uh, after them followed many others, 
uh, mostly French people looking uh, for uh, commercial trade, primarily the furs at, at this time. Now, when they had been, they had fought two great wars with the Iroquois nation uh, to the east of them uh, prior to coming to uh, Bowery Tongue, because the Iroquois who had been dealing with the French uh, had exhausted their country of uh, fur-bearing animals in such a short time. So the Iroquois came uh, west looking for uh, more richer lands that would produce, of course, things like the beaver and the mink. And uh, the Anishinaabe had to fight them away in two great wars. And of course, uh, now, when the French had finally caught up to them in the early 1600s, they, uh, they brought with them their missionaries. And uh, they made promises through their teachings and the religious faith of, uh, of uh, one who holds great salvation, great joy, and uh, the chiefs at that time, the leaders of the people, initially didn't think much of it. But they did send some of their young people uh, and allow them to be taught these things, not knowing at that time what it would entail. And of course, the teachings of the old lodge, when these children had learned enough and come back to the people, they had been somewhat brainwashed and told the people that their old teachings were evil and bad, and they needed to embrace uh, three things. To give the French what they wanted, which were the furs, and also to, uh, to turn away from the old teachings of the Madeoan. And so this is part of the great struggle that the people were going into at that time. So uh, the people were gripped with that and uh, in such a way that it was just uh, Some of the people accepted these ways while others didn't. They held on to the traditional ways through the Madewan. But at the same time, uh, this was upon them and it wouldn't leave them. And so all they, they accepted the French and their ways. It was getting to be ever more that wherever they went, uh, there was the the French became greater and greater and wanted more furs. And there, there was a struggle. And over time, they started depleting their lands because in exchange for the furs, uh, the Europeans brought uh, things they had never seen before, like steel knives, steel pots, uh, different kinds of items uh, that were mass produced but at the same time, uh, they wanted these things. The Anishinaabe wanted these things because they were, they were greater in durability. And of course, in the early parts, when the, when the Bajri gun, when the guns were introduced to them, they wanted those always, those also, but uh, initially the French wouldn't give them to them. Because they, the French knew if they acquired these guns that they also acquired a, an equality to, uh, to defend themselves and possibly drive them out initially. And so, but the Anishinaabe kept pushing for these, pushing for these guns and they wanted them. They learned their power, especially against their, uh, their enemy at that time who <clears throat> were in the, the southern part of, uh, Lake Superior, 
and to the west, they came into uh, conflict uh, with these people. So this was the grip, the great struggle that they were dealing with at that time. And uh, so it got to be where the Anishinaabe led these uh, trapping enterprises for the French initially. And then once these trapping grounds were exposed to the French, the French themselves took over these expeditions and led them themselves. and. Basically, the Anishinaabe became people who would continue to trap, but they traded at their trading posts and their forts all along the, the Western Great Lakes. And uh, so they started putting away the old teachings, the old uh, ways of doing things and accepting more the European, the white man's way of, uh, of having material things. There became a dependency upon them. And the fifth prophet also said, towards the end of this fire, there will come amongst the people who will hold a promise of great joy and salvation. And so again, I say that because it was a time that they seen their whole way of life kind of disappearing before uh, the actual greed and acceptance of this new way. But also there was this promise of that salvation and uh, great joy. And the people moved towards that. And then it was said by the, the fifth prophet that it would cause the near death of the people. Of course, at that time too, England had uh, wanted these furs because of the riches and the, the lifestyle of Europeans at that time, especially those who could afford it. So the the continent the interior of the continent was really being uh, pressed for uh these furs and the people became so dependent on them and of course uh the missionaries were always there and they were starting to build churches and and the conflict uh in the french and indian wars at this time also was a fight for uh, the furs. And uh, again, our people allowed ourselves to be put into the middle of this because of the acceptance of this, these new items that came. And so uh, there was much warfare over that. So let's go on to the sixth fire. Echo Ningo Washing Ashkode, the seventh or the sixth fire. In this time, it's going to be very evident that the promise of the fifth fire was came in a false way. That the missionaries had had pushed and relied upon the Anishinaabe to bring the people together and to bring them hope and happiness through materialism thing. And they uh, wanted this stuff. By this time, by this time, the Anishinaabe had acquired the guns. Trading was going so heavy within these trading posts that uh, they also acquired the, these guns, but we have records of uh, of these traders that when uh, these things came down through Hudson Bay, the trade goods, and also uh, the Northwest uh, Trading Company, which was owned by the English and Hudson Bay by the French, that coming with it, uh, 
30% of the goods that were coming down, also there was 30% of rum liquor sent to the trading post. So the whole idea of enabling the Anishinaabe to start drinking and stuff was because when the tribes and bands would come into the trading post in the spring, they would be a celebration and they would offer them liquor. And of course, uh, there was no tolerance for this stuff amongst the bands and they would get horribly drunk and uh, it would just create big issues for them. And then at the same time, uh, they would want to open up the trading, the furs and trade for the articles they wanted to trade for. Uh, the guns, the ammunition, the powder, uh, the knives, uh, the pots for ma new materials, uh, cloth materials. And also there was needles, metal needles and, and beads and all kinds of stuff. Well, of course, the trader would stay sober, in a, but because of this, one-sided trading thing and then many of the, the the chiefs and the leaders amongst the different bands they would sell their and trade their their furs for far less than they would would uh be worth because they were intoxicated and uh and then many of them at the conclusion of this, they they would leave with, uh, without their furs, of course, but little in trade, and this was the tactic of of the of the trading post, and it led to a lot of uh, disparity amongst the uh, the bands because uh, there was so much unbalance at that time because. The women uh, were subject to doing a lot of the labor at that time. Once these animals were uh, were trapped, that the women had to skin them and take care of the hides and all of this and pack them out of the uh, the winter camps where the trading or trapping was going on. And generally, and in a lot of cases, they did not receive uh, any. Uh, of the trade goods, what they had been promised by their husbands or, you know, uh, the head of their families. And because a lot of times during these drunken events that, you know, the women were abused. And so it caused that great division amongst the people. And uh, so they found that it, uh, this uh, message of joy and salvation wasn't what it was at all because uh, uh, it was just a false promise. It was a false promise, so. I'm kind of getting lost here in what I was going to do. Okay, here we go. All right, what I was going to say. So it was also at this time that we know that in this era that uh, the children were start starting to be taken away on a a, a rather uh, um, regular basis and a lot of the tribal people and it was up to the chiefs at that time and the leadership that they would uh, allow their children or the families or clans of certain ones to go into some kind of a religious training and school and so this was happening continually 
wherever there was be a missionary and uh, they put up a mission and they would say that the missionaries would say that they would uh, schooling is good for them. We need to teach them French. We need to teach them uh, the ways of the of, of the Europeans. So it would create a better way of communication and a way of life as far as uh, of brotherhood, they called it. And so this kind of a, 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 a simulation process in the beginning uh, was with the approval of a lot of the chiefs at that time. And of course that didn't turn well for the natives because all that was behind it was they wanted access to their uh, trapping grounds and to continue to move across the continent in such a way that, you know, they would have the support of their, of uh, these, uh, the chiefs, the bands and the missionaries. And so it's also during this time that you have these children and grandchildren actually turning against their elders. And uh, they, that's something that does, didn't just happen in this generation. It's, it came out of uh, the ways teaching the teachings of the, the Medeoan and as opposed to the church, what they seen was uh, a better and new way of, of, of living and to, uh, to submit totally to the Christian God and that these old teachings and old way of beliefs were evil, they were bad, and that the people must look toward the future, and this was the way. But at the same time, uh, the motivation behind all of this was, of course, uh, the colonial powers wanting the riches of this land. And uh, they weren't interested so much in saving souls as they wanted the riches of the land. And of course, uh, this included the church at that time. So, it said that uh, because of the grandchildren and children of this age would oppose the elders and argue with the elders, uh, the elders started to have no purpose in life because traditionally the elders become the teachers of the people, the teachers of the way of, uh, of life that has sustained us for thousands of years. Uh, that balance, that relationship with nature, Akin, the earth, and all the living things. And uh, we've seen at this point in time, the real beginning of the great grip, the great struggle, because the use of, uh, of wiping out uh, uh, whole areas of fur-bearing animals for, uh, for the sole purpose of vanity, the white man's, European's vanity of having these furs on their shoulders, on their heads, uh, to show their kind of elitistness, uh, that they didn't benefit uh, a whole time because it basically destroyed a lot of these rich areas that, uh, like the beaver, uh, had an important uh, role in the balance of the waters and the keeping areas nice and pristine and balanced and stuff. Of course, the missionaries uh, had no uh, uh, clear concept of this and uh, much less didn't want to accept that kind of way of thinking. So they would lose their purpose in life, these elders. Uh, it said that a new sickness would come upon the people. Now, 
different scholars have argued that this was uh, perhaps the smallpox epidemics which hit, you know, uh, particularly hard uh, the native people and that uh, and that a lot of times it was spread purposely amongst the tribes in the trade goods, particularly the the cloth and blankets that were traded uh, with the indigenous people uh, throughout the Great Lakes and of course the the plains area, and it basically extinguished a lot of people. Uh, perhaps one out of 10 people, one out of 50 people in particular bands, wherever they were camped, uh, it just uh, survived this type of uh, 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 biological warfare. But at the same time, by this era, I also believe that this, uh, this kind of sickness was also agreed. Agreed that uh, in a confusion that people actually started to realize that and became clear sighted that they actually they had to they were responsible for allowing the French uh, to come in and to use them as such. And initially, it may have been innocent, but over time, because of their dependency on materialism and uh, allowing their lands be depleted of fur-bearing animals and how the trade was going and the alcohol that was involved, I do believe that some chiefs and bands fought against this kind of be because it was season after season they would get beat in the trade. And our people were good and always had traded, but they knew that this kind of influence through alcohol should not have been in the equation. And that they purposely did it because they brought it and started the, they wouldn't do the trade and, until they had drunk this, uh, this liquor first. And of course, everything went south after that and uh, the people came away uh, with hardly anything. And there was killings amongst them because uh, it, they became so inebriated that uh, they didn't realize what they were doing. Their mind wasn't clear. So I believe this was all part of a, a great sickness that came amongst the people and they didn't know how to deal with it. It had been established. They had been already by the, the first, when the French came, that first generation of offspring with the native women and the French, those usually followed in general their mother's way. But the succeeding generations, they usually were, went by way of uh, their father and of course the missionaries. And uh, so it didn't happen right away, but over time. And so we had a whole lot of people uh, looking into the business aspect, aspect and the exploitation of the land. And of course, always at these uh, settlements that came up, uh, the mission school, the church was at, always in the center of wherever they had a settlement and usually around the trading post. So this was uh, something that became very evident. It said the balance of many people would be disturbed the people's will to live will be lost at the loss of their children. And by then, in the middle or towards the end of the sixth century or sixth fire, we see also uh, the establishment of uh, the government 
and the church actually trying in a brutal way actually robbing the people of their next generations and this took place from the east and came towards the west including canada where children were taken away forcefully uh, or through manipulation uh, into boarding schools. Uh, in the beginning, they tried to establish these schools on lands near where their people lived, but because of the people's uh, nearness to uh, uh, their way of life, living within those seasons, when hunting season would come, the kids would follow the family. When the berry picking or wild rice, the kids wouldn't show up for school and, and so on and so forth. And it uh, disturbed the, the church and the government's continuum to try to keep the children in school away from uh, their families. So they came up with the idea of putting them far very far away from their homes. And so, and of course, once they were there, they stripped them of their dignity, cutting their hair, forbidden to speak their language, following any kinds of customs or traditions of their people. And uh, it must have been uh, very shocking and traumatic uh, for these children as young as five and six be taken away. And of course, older ones who had been there for a while and trying to deal with that. And so we see now this whole promise again of jo great joy and salvation. It was a false promise for our people, very much so. Uh, so it became the cup of grief instead of the cup of life and of happiness. Uh, it's also said that when this seventh or sixth prophet spoke this, this prophecy about the future, that there was within this great group that were listening to these prophecies on the East Coast, uh, that some of them scoffed at it. To hear in somewhat some detail, some understanding of what these prophets were saying, they couldn't believe it. They wouldn't believe it. They scoffed at it. And they said, We have great medicine. We have we have we're a great nation. Nobody has come against us. Uh, there is peace within our lands and peace with our neighbors. And how can this be? They scoffed at it. And so we know that those that stayed behind, those Anishinaabe, those tribes, those nations, those bands that stayed there, they were the first ones uh, to uh, come under uh, the so-called uh, being tricked, uh, being manipulated, being exterminated by the first Europeans. And it's taken uh, hundreds of years for them to recover. And only in the last maybe uh, decade or uh, a generation have they been somewhat been able to recover from a, a more kinder, belligerent uh, nation. But uh, many of them were completely wiped out, exterminated because the greed for the land and after they had been given knowledge on how to raise their crops and live off the land, they wanted more and more and more. So we see greed running through all of this. Okay. Because of what was going on back there in the seventh uh, fire, uh, 
we also seen something else that was going on uh, when we reflect back on this. And like in my grandmother's day and uh, my grandfather's day and and in their generation before them, that the priests were at the forefront once the people were brought and rounded up and put on reservations and forbidden to leave the reservation, uh, they there was a, a real uh, uh, practice of where the priests would come and by then he knew all the these people that were there the different bands and who were traditional chiefs who were practicing the old ways and this and that and he he realized he had to stamp these this whole traditional idea out of the people so they actually rounded up uh, objects like the wigwas, bakun, birch bark scrolls, uh, sacred bundles, uh, sacred teachings, uh, anything that had to do with the old ways and teachings of the Medeowin. And uh, actual chiefs uh, who were traditional and, and not uh, contemporary thinking, they they followed the ways of the old teachings. Many of these chiefs were uh, abducted at night, kidnapped and taken away into uh, far areas uh, where they were imprisoned in insane asylums. And they were never returned to their people. And many of the missionaries were at the forefront of the destruction of uh, articles and uh, items that the people had held and they tried to uh, get rid of them, destroy them. So the people would, in the next generation, would not have no uh, kind of tangible things to refer to about their past. So this, the church was very much involved with and uh, because uh, they were part of the re-education process of their people. So, uh, the people were forbidden to practice ceremonies. They were forbidden to practice their old ways uh, with the threat of punishment and uh, being confined or jailed or taken away, uh, starvation. People became dependent on the government rations that came from time to time. And uh, there's documents and history of our people starving uh, because a lot of this stuff was rancid and no good to eat and uh, something left over perhaps from the Civil War or something that had been stored for years in some kind of warehouse but uh, the people were starving the lands had been depleted of course a lot of the animals didn't come back. So people uh, were really, had come to a point where they were under this uh, kind of totalitarian kind of government, colonized government. So very sad, very sad. Yeah. Was that the same time period? Because I've read about the government sterilizing native lands as well so they couldn't be produced was that the same time period as well or was that i think it came towards the ends because this was at the time when uh we uh we knew some of these uh uh, uh, uh boarding schools they had uh nurses on staff but you they usually didn't have doctors and staff but uh I do believe that it was at this time that there was experimentation that they believed that, you know, where they got that idea uh, of doing that, that, yeah, a lot of these women had, young ladies had come home uh, and 
haven't been uh, sterilized. Uh, we know that it happened uh, during the First World War era and also the Second World War. There was uh, there was things about that when they had gone into the military to help the war effort that a lot of them uh, came back and they were sterilized and they thought they were going through a different procedure, but in fact, they were sedated and and the outcome they uh, they were actually sterilized in this process. So, and uh, a note, a note that when uh, World War II broke out and Adolf Hitler was looking for some kind of a and uh, a tried way to deal with the Jewish people that uh, he had read about the incarceration of native peoples and the reservation and all the experiments that have been done with them and this whole idea of keeping them within a confined area, everything that went with that. He actually uh, embraced that idea and where they started persecuting the the Jewish people and rounding them up in these uh, confinement areas and, and actually doing medical tests and experimentation with them. This is where he got that idea is from uh, the English and the church. Uh, the government and the church during this time because uh, it was all about racism and prejudice. And in those eras that the white people firmly believed that they, that this country belonged to them and it was God given right to them. And they used every means possible to convince the natives that uh, that this land was them at theirs. And uh, of course, all the treaties were broken, agreements, and that, uh, and so the people were left in despair for generations, generations. And of course, we know that uh, the people suffered greatly and many lives were lost from the time the first White people came to the continent, and some say there's no accurate record of that, of around 80 million on the continent. And by 1890, 1900, uh, there was less than two, a quarter million, 250,000 people actually often. Of course, we know today that many, many of those children did not come home uh, either as children or uh, older children or young adults. Uh, none of them bottomed in return. Of course, we know that a lot of them uh, laid or in quiet, somewhat graves uh, that. Uh, the church wanted the public appeared they tried to make it where they would not find out so uh, yeah well let's go on to the the seventh fire here so uh yeah echo needs you watching Ishko day so the seventh prophet said in the time of the seventh fire, new people will emerge. They will retrace their steps to find what was left by the trail. Their steps will take them to the elders who they will ask to guide them on their journey. But many of the elders will have fallen asleep. They will awaken to this new time for nothing to offer. Some of the elders will be silent because no one will ask them any anything the new people will have to be careful in how they approach the elders the task of the new people will not be easy 
So when I see the Snoop people here, uh, I'm living in a time now when many of our people, many of our, even our people on the reservations, they know nothing of themselves, their clans, uh, their traditional, their cultural way. Uh, the church had been so successful in, uh, in their mission to eradicate knowledge, uh, culture, ceremony, language, uh, that many of the children that I come to know in schools when talking to them about their identity, they didn't even know they were an Ishnabe, they were native. Uh, they'd been raised already in several generations of home who didn't look at our traditional cultural way as a way of living, but something of suffering and uh, anguish, something in the past that they have been convinced that there was no way uh, forward for them through these cultural ways. But young people started having dreams. They started hearing voices in their dreams about them telling to go back to, to look for uh, their language, their culture, their traditions. Uh, the elders who had passed away generations, maybe hundreds of years before that, their spirits were still calling to maybe that fourth or seventh generation and uh, because it was so strong. People come forward and say, I want to learn about something about my culture, about who I am, who my people were, and what can be. By then, many of the elders who actually had any knowledge, they were gone. We live in a time where very few elders uh, have any really good knowledge about our culture and about our traditions and something they didn't learn out of books, but they learned from elders who were before them. Some had not embraced and somehow uh, escaped uh, or were hid uh, from the church, from the government pressing mandatory education. Uh, some of them didn't have any knowledge. And some of them were so traumatized and hurt uh, that they had been taught how not to say anything about it because they had been traumatized so much in these uh, orphanages. And these things are recent archaic thing of the past that aren't so long ago. There's still many people who remember their experiences in the orphanage and uh, boarding schools. So, uh, and most of them, if not all of them, they weren't good. They weren't good. So, because the new people don't have any knowledge of how to approach the old people, the elders, uh, they look for ways to do it. But also at the same time, uh, a lot of the elders had been traumatized themselves. So it was not going to be a task, uh, an easy task for them to, to do that. So they had to approach the elders carefully realizing that many of them had been traumatized themselves, uh, showing the sincerity of what they were wanted to approach them for and learn. And also uh, because there had been many generations that pass of silence amongst the elders. 
many generations. It took the women and the young people to come forward, even the men, even the men. A lot of the men not had been teached from the elders. And so the men did what they could or they couldn't. Uh, it was also during this last fire too, an interesting thing would happen amongst our people that would a lot of times be as a thorn in our side or in our being is that because the, the, the teachings of the old way take so much time and patience uh, that in order to, to do that, they're not acquiring an understanding. So men and women are going through these teachings and they're anxious. And sometimes when the elders re rebuff them or say, no, you need to, you know, it's not your time to do this yet. It's not your time to uh, do that. They go ahead and do it anyway. And they uh, start practicing or start lying and said, the elders gave me this way or do this. And so we're living in a time now of many false prophets, many false teachers within our way. Uh, so pipe carriers and lodge keepers and people who falsely said they were given a right to speak about all of this. And they weren't, in fact, because they had not finished their teachings, acquired the understanding of what needed to be done and embrace the seven teachings and live that while, that uh, those ways. So a lot of false teachers are here now, and it will also dilute our teachings and dilute our understanding of things and uh, diminish us somewhat in strength as a fire, as a nation. But it won't keep us from progressing forward because there are sincere people out there, young people who want to learn and do things the respectful and honorable way. Uh, one of the main teachings out of the seventh fire comes that the people will be allowed two choices. Okay, the people will all be, all people will be allowed two choices and two paths to take. One is the green path, the path that leads to life, respect for all living things, understanding that the creator created all things and all life forms have a purpose. And that we as human beings find our purpose in with uh, the circle that was given to us. And uh, it is not something else. So, of course, this will be encouraged and taught by the this the our medicine people our our elders about this and uh, so that's one path that's one choice the other others will be a life down a dark road a charred road if I might say they take that there is really no life there. And some say that life, that charred road leads to tech, the use of, the overuse of technology and the abuse of technology, instead of using it for the better, that it will be used to harm people uh, and take people away from family, from friends, from relatives, 
from their reliance on the interconnectedness of the life forms within our world. Uh, and there won't be no balance that will cause an, an imbalance in their life and also many deaths. That the green low uh, road is and path is the road to uh, balance, life and peace, harmony with all living things. Uh, a road that the creators always wanted us to live uh, was his purpose, I believe. But this other way, uh, will lead to a spiritual destruction of the people. So those are the two paths that face face mankind at this time. And uh, it's something that uh, that's right in front of us uh, that people need to really look at and, you know, what is the right way? What isn't the wrong way? Uh, and live in our lives. Now, they say, the elders say, if we follow that green path and we live that path and embrace it totally, there will be an eighth fire eventually lit and it will become a time of eternal peace for all mankind and uh, for, for all living things. But this other path, the start path, charred path will come a time of where life will be extinguished. I mean, it's not a hard choice at all, in my understanding. But again, the greed, selfishness of people, communities, and nations uh, built on a lie, a falsehood, uh, a deviant behavior that aren't that isn't balanced. Uh, people are led astray by their own thinking, by they uh, a world of materialism and power, ego. So, yeah. Okay, well, that's, that's the conclusion. Uh, miigwech, miigwech. Try to have a good day. Smile, be kind to one another. Uh -huh.